Welcome to the Royal Horticultural Society's 77th Great Spring Show, better known to you and me as Chelsea. This is the most prestigious event in the gardening year when gardeners come from all over the world to compete for this, the Royal Horticultural Society's gold medal. And they'll create a spectacle that'll use up all the superlatives you can find in the Oxford English Dictionary. But Chelsea is not only a magnificent spectacle, it's also the meeting place for the gardening professionals. They come here year after year to renew old acquaintances and to keep an eye open for the latest developments in horticulture. And of course, this is where nurserymen and plant breeders can meet their customers, show them their new introductions, and find out what you, the gardeners, would like to see in your own gardens. For lovers of flowers, this is the most sumptuous spectacle of the year. A riot of color that's a feast for the eye and a host of scents and perfume that'll take your breath away. Royal gardeners, armchair gardeners, gardeners with country estates and with pocket handkerchiefs, they all come to Chelsea to learn. Take Dr. Stefan Bachaksi. Stefan, what kind of garden have you got? Would well, you know, Alan, I have lovely soil, I have some fine plants in a super little village just outside Stratford-upon-Avon, but my problem is I'm never there to look after it. So when I come to Chelsea, I'm on the lookout for ideas about low-maintenance gardening. Well, about Maureen Stewart, what does, a, what does a newscaster have in the way of a garden, Maureen? You know, I don't have a garden. I'm afraid I can kill any plant at 30 paces. I'm hoping <laughs> to mend my ways. Mind you, is there anything that Chelsea can teach you? Well, yes, I mean, standing on this slope here, I look at rhododendrons and know that I can't grow a single one of them on my chalky soil. But then, like most of us who come here, I suspect I come to dream a bit as well, because, you know, a lot of the things we're going to show you over the next 45 minutes are not really real. The time has come the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings. And that's the title of this garden. Real Noel, you've designed it. Why cabbages and kings? Well, Chelsea's a fun place to be. And why not a fantasy at Chelsea? Well, there is fantasy here. There's also wonderful perspective. How do you achieve it? Well, what I do is to grade the color so that the bright colors are very close to the audience and gradually they fade up towards the background. And I also use very mellow bricks so that they don't hit you in the eye. The other thing I try and do is to use circles and lines that curve towards the boundaries, and that gives you a great sense of space. And I thought it was just a fantasy. There are 23 gardens outdoors at this year's Chelsea Flower Show, each and every one of them at the peak of perfection. Now, you could argue that that in itself is unreal. I mean, once the flowers fade this week, if it were a real garden, there'd be nothing to see for the rest of the year. But in the case of this particular garden, that just isn't true. This is a garden for roses, designed for B&Q by David Stevens, and showing just how roses, be they hybrid teas, floribundas, shrub roses or ground cover roses, can be fitted into a garden that contains other plants. The climbers and ramblers go up a pergola. Ground cover roses help keep the weeds down. And even those big full-blown hybrid teas, like this brand new one, Spirit of Youth, can be improved by interplanting them with things like grey-leaved artemisia. That means you get colour and interest for as much of the year as possible. What's really staggering is that you can achieve nearly as much brilliance without flowers. This garden of tranquility relies almost entirely on foliage for its form, shape, texture and colour. What's more, it had looked like this for around eight months of the year. Just try your hand at designing with leaves, giant rhubarb and gardener's garters, purple-leaved berberis and golden-leaved hosta, with water adding its own sense of restfulness. Now this is definitely a designer garden. The interior blue colour scheme is continued out here by lobelia in the hanging baskets and the blue glazed pot. Very tiny garden, very beautiful, but doubled in size by the very clever use of a mirror set into the wall. Well, tiny this garden may be, but the paving doubles it in size. All of these plants are very easily available and I really like the use of the peach rhododendron at the back with, against the gold of the variegated laurel. So clever. And after all that boldness and colour, a moment of peace and tranquility. 
Lovely. Now, quite different is the Bressingham Garden, a true plantsman's garden with over 500 different varieties of shrubs and perennials on show. Some old favourites and some new varieties. They've also used perennials in the hanging baskets and they can either be planted out at the end of the summer or kept from year to year. Now here's another very attractive hanging basket, but this is a hanging basket with a difference because when you look closely at it, you can see that it's planted up entirely with wild flowers. And so is the rest of this balcony around me, basically the balcony of an urban house. Now this is unlike most gardens of this type. It's the John Chambers wildflower garden designed by Julie Toll. And on one side of it is what is basically a conventional wildflower garden, a lawn, a meadow with a good sprinkling of native plants. On the other side though, and this is completely new to Chelsea and new to me, is a wildflower garden which is basically arranged in beds and borders. It's simply that it's planted up with native plants, basically single ones, unlike the cultivated varieties which very often are double. It's beautiful, but don't imagine wildflower gardening is easy, so just by buying a few packets of wildflower seed you can't go home and instantly create this. But this, as I've said, is really an urban house. Now, just across the way from here is a true country garden with country flowers, but it's one with a difference because, like many gardens in southern England, it has fallen trees in it. The designer of that garden, Jane Cordingly, has very cleverly incorporated these fallen trees into her design. And I asked Jane where she had the original idea for this. I was working at night all the way through those January storms that we had and the wind was making such a noise in my casements and sashes that I knew it was a really destructive wind and I had the idea that in the morning there would be quite a number of trees down as a result of this really bad wind and um, it seemed to me a terrific waste to take just the trunk away and burn the branches which is mostly what happened you probably remember the bonfires of 1987 and it's a great it's a colossal um, ungratefulness to burn something that's taken perhaps 300 years of growing and so there's several ideas here for how to use timber. You can use it for instance to make paths and here the branches of a large hornbeam tree have been uh, cut up, disked and then laid to make paths and that is where the idea for the lull after the storm came. But you know, this garden, and in fact all the gardens at Chelsea, look absolutely wonderful now, but it's only a matter of hours ago that it was chaos. The place was a hive of activity, people going to and fro, getting everything ready. Exhibitors come to Chelsea from all over the world, and there's so little time to make all those final adjustments. The care and dedication is intense. All of the plants need tending, lawns need laying, but for some, the effort is just all too much. And to think, at the end of the week, the whole spectacle will be raised to the ground. Right now, though, the excitement is building for the arrival of Her Majesty the Queen. The Queen is welcomed by Robin Herbert, President of the Royal Horticultural Society. And with so many keen gardeners amongst the royal family, Chelsea is an enjoyable yearly visit. Her first stop is to admire the mass of annual blooms staged by the British Bedding Plant Association. At the Garden of Tranquility, Ken Linsell from Cramphorn Nurseries explains the thinking behind a garden that relies solely on foliage plants for its effect. Further along the rock bank, the Mariner's Retreat catches her eye. Designed by students from Merristwood College and representing a secluded cottage garden for a retired seaman. The wide range of formal and informal gardens on display, coupled with the fine weather, means the Queen is spending some time enjoying the talent and ingenuity of Britain's top garden designers. This year, the Women's Institute celebrates its 75th anniversary. Chairman Jean Varman explains that their romantic Victorian garden, appropriately called Green and Pleasant Land, is the brainchild of Kate Chambers, a WI member from Hale in Staffordshire. Princess Margaret and the Duchess of Gloucester enjoy the exhibits in the Marquee. Princess Michael of Kent admires the beautiful yellow rose that bears her name. Her growing collection of catalogues and brochures reveal her to be a keen gardener. 
Royal visit or not, the business of preparing for the evening's gala event goes on, while the Queen meets Peter Thomas, Birmingham's chief parks manager, who describes all the planning and hard work that's gone into Heart of the Arts, the city's latest attempt to add to its already record number of gold awards. And in a few moments, the Queen Mother will be arriving to receive this beautiful arrangement of the rose named after her, the Queen Mother. And this lovely new rose from Maddox has been called Queen Mother in celebration of her 90th birthday this year. Sales of rose bushes will benefit one of her favourite charities, the Royal United Kingdom Beneficent Association, that gives financial and practical help to elderly people in need. You know, you could almost believe you were in a formal rose garden here until you looked up and saw the canvas over your head. A garden packed with roses old and roses new. You can choose which you want, but sometimes roses choose you, particularly if your garden's small. And that, I think, is why patio roses are becoming so popular. Queen Mother is a patio rose. So, too, is this one about to take its place in history. Peristroika, bright yellow flowers with these wonderful pointed and quilled petals. If it's anything like as good as Sweet Dream, this peachy apricot variety, which was Rose of the Year in 1988, it'll be a real winner. All these patio roses are below knee height, and most of them seem to have really disease-resistant foliage. Plant these roses about 15 inches apart, and they'll give you fairly good ground cover, but you'll get even better ground cover, still with recurrent flowering right the way through the summer, from the County series of roses. There are two new ones this year, Northamptonshire, which has semi-double flesh pink blooms, and Norfolk, fully double primrose yellow flowers. They'll need a hand in the early stages, give them a really good mulch of pulverised bark, but then they'll make this thick, dense rug over the ground, and all they need is a light trim in winter to keep them in shape. The next time you open a pot of breakfast marmalade and you see the royal coat of arms on the lid, Spare a thought for this rose. It's called By Appointment, and it celebrates the 150th anniversary of the Royal Warrant Holders Association. Those are the select band of people that can put the royal coat of arms on their product because it's used by the Queen. She came along yesterday and gave this the royal seal of approval. Well, we get new roses every year at Chelsea, and there are those who come for the old and antique roses. But what of those hybrid teas and floribundas that came out 10, 20 years ago? Have they disappeared? Well, there's one rose that will stay in the hearts of lots of gardeners, and certainly in mine, because it's the first rose I ever bought as a youth. It's called Ina Harkness, and it commemorates a woman born in 1906 who died in January this year. She was a great rose grower and raiser, and this beautiful crimson scented flower is still grown today by many who appreciate its finer qualities. Well, for any lover of roses, the society to belong to is the Royal National Rose Society. It's the oldest and largest specialist plant society in the world, and it was founded as long ago as 1876. But believe it or not, this is the first year they've actually had an exhibit here at Chelsea. Well, the secretary of the society is Ken Grapes. Ken, why the long wait? Long is the operative word, I think, Stefan, because the Society gave its first gold medal for a new award-winning rose as long ago as the 1890s, if you please. We've been a bit concerned that roses that have won awards in the Society's international trials at St Albans have not perhaps achieved quite the popularity which we reckon they deserve. So we thought we'd show them off to the public here. So all the roses on your stand have been given awards by the Society? Every single one of them, yes. Out of about perhaps 200 on trial in a particular year, about 10% only received the top awards, and they're truly represented here. There's a particularly lovely one called Tequila Sunrise, a royal favourite of mine, from Pat Dixon of Northern Ireland. It's a lovely uh, yellow, full-flowered uh, variety, flushed beautifully with pink, which deepens when it's outside in the sunshine. Now, most of the roses we've seen so far have been modern varieties, but I have to confess, my own real love is the old roses, and this is the place to come and see them. This is the stand of Peter Beale's roses, and what wonderful attributes this rose, these roses have. They are beautiful. They have lovely soft colours, they have fragrance, and, of course, they have history. There are roses on this stand, just like those that the great Belgian plant painter Redoute painted, the ones that were grown in the Empress Josephine's garden at Malmaison. A modern rose doesn't give you that, does it? But I have to confess that some of the old roses do have drawbacks. Most of them, for instance, only flower for a short period at the beginning of the summer. 
But interestingly, this year, Peter Beals has introduced what must pass for him as a very new rose. It's derived from a 60-year-old climber called New Dawn, which itself is a sport of a very old variety. And this is the new one. Beautiful. It's called Awakening. And it was brought from Czechoslovakia in 1985, and its name is the literal translation of the Czech word for awakening. But of course, the developments in that country since then have made its name even more relevant today. So perhaps, after all, we shouldn't be talking about old roses and new roses and arguing their relative merits. We should use the word that Peter Beals used for them, classic roses. Take the best of all ages, and those are the roses we want to see in our gardens. International exhibitors are here in force, chasing gold medals and export markets. Zimbabwe makes its debut with a striking display of proteas, perhaps a new addition to the flower arranger's repertoire. For many gardeners, the real highlights of the Chelsea Flower Show are the new plants and the rediscovered old varieties on display. This year is certainly no exception. There's a really exciting range of new things to see. What about this for a start? This is a stunning new hippiastrum from Van Tubergen. It's called Lady Jane. And this is the first double flowered variety to be generally available. It actually has the other distinct advantage of being rather shorter stemmed than usual. So there's no more of that tiresome staking that you so often have to do with these plants. Every year, blooms of Bressingham can be relied upon to introduce some interesting and unusual new varieties. I was impressed with this low-growing white dicentra called Snowflake, a very valuable new form of a popular old plant. Blooms have also introduced this low-growing pale yellow Achillea, although I must confess that it's hard to love Achilleas because I spent so long eradicating the wild species from my own lawn. Much more attractive, I think, is this Chrysanthemum pacifica, which will have yellow flowers later in the year, but is really being promoted now as a foliage plant with these clearly defined matte green leaves with very narrow pale edges. Kelways have a new peony called Kelways Unique, which has a markedly flat rose pink flower and pale yellow stamens. Aquilegias are always popular, especially as cottage garden plants. Here on the Japanese Garden Company display is a new white variety called Graham Eden, which has this unusual vivid green and yellow variegated foliage. There's increasing interest now in foliage plants that are suitable for smaller gardens. And in this area, Hilliers are showing the first generally available hybrid choisia. It's called Aztec Pearl. And it has a, a different leaf shape from the more familiar choisia ternata, the Mexican orange blossom. But I'm pleased to say they have managed to retain that delicious choisia perfume. It's very pleasing to see affordable varieties appearing where perhaps cost has been a drawback in the past. For instance, Knotcuts are promoting this cut-leaved elder, Sambucus resmosa tenuifolia, as a substitute for the rather costly but less tough Acer palmatum dissectum types. And the same nursery has this bamboo, Arundinaria simba, which looks very like some of the tall-growing traditional bamboos, but is much more compact. And what about this? An Escalonia with variegated foliage, it's on the hop list stand, although it's not yet on sale. You see, generally, nurseries like to use Chelsea to introduce new additions to their current catalogues, but this one seemed just too interesting to hold back. Clematis are always popular, but I had a particular personal interest in a new one being displayed by the Guernsey Clematis Nursery on the Guernsey Island stand. It's a variety of Clematis viticella called Polish Spirit, and it was raised in Poland by a monk, Brother Stefan Franczak. I think that the fragrance of pinks is one of the great joys of the English garden. And the colour range seems to get bigger and more interesting every year. This is candy, a vivid pink bicolour from the Stephen Bailey nursery, but yes, it has retained all that traditional pink fragrance. And these smell pretty gorgeous too. Labelled Alan Titchmarsh, they're white, green-eyed that are definitely bloodshot. Oh. Well, do you know, it's a funny thing, I've just been in the marquee and there's a lupin in there called Alan Titchmarsh. It's a great big fat yellow thing. I gather it wasn't very good this year. It just went over early because of the sun. But I prefer my sweet pea, actually, which is pink, delicately scented with a frilly edge. But just a minute, you had a potato named after you, as I recall. Nearly. 
What do you mean, nearly? Well, it never quite saw the light of day. Why? Light. <laughs> How are the mighty fallen? So that today's celebrities fare rather better. Well, I think they look like my earrings, actually. <laughs> and it's called my own name up there. So I'm thrilled. How popular can you get? <laughs> That famous Borsetshire village of Ambridge has had a rose named after it, and Jack Woolley and Peggy Archer would seem to be having a quiet tete-a-tete -tete over it, if Grey Gable chef Jean-Paul wasn't playing gooseberry. A recent and rewarding trend has been to involve the introduction of a well-named flower with a charity. Professor Magda Jacob, celebrated transplant surgeon, what brings you to Chelsea this year? Oh, I always try and come to Chelsea. I've been doing this for many years now. I grow orchids, among other things. Do you? Yeah. Successfully? Well, with <laughs> those varying degrees of success, shall we say. And I gather you've got a connection yeah. this year with the orchid behind you. Uh, yes. Uh, I, Ray Bilton and McBeans were kind enough uh, to recognize the work of the hospital and. Uh, actually, the Harefield Hospital. The Harefield Hospital. And, uh, as we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the transplant program, he elected to name this orchid after me. Uh, and therefore, I was really so grateful and overwhelmed and came to look at it again. This rose is called Winners All, and it's um, to mark the Special Olympics for mentally handicapped people for sport, training, you know, so we sort of like nature, mentally handicapped, and kids and that, just like you'd, you'd know, nurture a rose. And so this is why it's called Winners All. Will you ride along with me then, Jane? Yeah! <laughs> First class, yeah. <laughs> you might even beat me. No, I won't. <laughs> Trevor Hicks, chairman of the Hillsborough Families Support Group, you're launching a new rose. Tell me about its background. Um, well, basically, the rose uh, follows a long story. We felt that we wanted some permanent living memorial for our loved ones. Um, the idea of a rose uh, signifying strength and beauty was one that appealed to us all. Um, we were put in touch with Gareth Fryer, the owner of the nursery, who very kindly donated the name to us. Our family group at one of its meetings chose from a, about 15 possibilities the name Liverpool remembers. Um, specifically so that we did just that, that not only Liverpool but we hoped everybody who saw the rose in the future would remember what happened on April the 15th, 89 and it seemed a, a very fitting way uh, you know, to remember our, our loved ones. Trevor Hicks, thank you so much. Liverpool remembers a beautiful fitting memorial. The high spot of the Chelsea social scene is undoubtedly the charity gala preview on Monday evening when the royal family have departed. Here, for the princely sum of £100, you can rub shoulders with stars of stage and screen. The charity benefiting from the preview is Help the Aged, whose garden has been designed by Robin Williams. The charity has its own celebrity helpers in the form of Sage, Stage for Age, whose chairman is Robert Powell. Well, it's... Um... It's a group of people who are involved in, in the theatre and in, in actually most branches of entertainment who uh, on an ad hoc basis have for years helped the aged. And we were asked to formalise it and form a committee that, um, that really could be on tap uh, all the time, which we are. Now what's the theme of this Help the Aged Garden? Well, its theme um, in terms of colour is, is white and yellow, which not only signifies the logo of Help the Aged, but it also, I think, signifies golden afternoons of, uh, of maybe one's later years. <laughs> lots of London. walkways here that are easily accessible. Yes, no steps, lots of places to sit down. I think it's a, it's a perfect garden for, for a, an elderly person. And just the kind of place for an actor to have a restful afternoon, I suppose. Really. Very nice, with a glass of champagne and his mates. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. For the first time this year, there's a Disabled Gardener's Advice Centre at the show, aimed at making gardening easier for everyone. 
the stand was visited by the Princess Royal, patron of the College of Occupational Therapists. The blind and partially sighted have their own special requirements, as this garden, constructed by the London Association for the Blind, demonstrates. This bright pink rhododendron might look a bit strident to you and me, but it's easy for someone with failing sight to pick it out against a cooler sea of green. There are raised beds for easy cultivation, and the smooth path is edged with rougher cobbles that your feet can detect to keep you on the straight and narrow. Everywhere there are plants to smell those aromatic leaves of eucalyptus and plants to touch, the soft and downy spike of a foxglove and the delicate tracery of ornamental bamboo. And all the while, the restful sound of water gurgling over a millstone. Some of the most spectacular stands at Chelsea belong to the local authorities particularly this magnificent portico which belongs to the City of Birmingham exhibit. It's called Birmingham Heart of the Arts, particularly topical with Sadler's Wells and the Doily Cart Company moving there. Ornamental plants grown in the city's greenhouses provide a riot of colour. Some, like these poinsettias, have been grown out of season and tricked into thinking it's Christmas. Very different is the Royal Parks display, equally stunning and made entirely of hardy annuals a real inspiration to any gardener of what can be raised from seed. The Cheshire Gardens' new exhibitors are displaying a woodland garden. This combination of public and private sector gardens, Cheshire County Council, Tatton Park, Ness Gardens, Arley Hall and Chester Zoo is the first exhibitors' consortium at Chelsea. And of course, the Gateshead National Garden Festival is here with this 10-foot pyramid made of 8,000 begonias. Now this must be one of the biggest trees in captivity. It's actually a 12-year-old lime tree and it's been raised in a huge container especially for transplanting. In fact what's happened is it's been moved on two or three times until it finishes up in this very very large square pot. Well, I say pot, basically it's a plastic bag caged in with steel netting and it's been opened out here so you can see it. It's square, interestingly enough, because the Americans have discovered that in a square pot, when the tree's roots hit the corner, they go straight down, and that tends to make for a much better root ball. Now, this obviously has its attractions. If you've lost trees in the great storm, or you're just impatient and want an instant landscape, a very good idea for your garden, you might think, but hasten slowly. This little beauty would set you back about 500 pounds, and bigger ones could go up to 2,000 pounds. But if you're prepared to lower your sights and accept, for instance, this 10-year-old beech at about £120 only, then this is much more realistic. But you must, must follow two golden rules when you're transplanting big trees of any size. The first is to prepare the site as thoroughly as possible. That means plenty of organic matter, manure, compost, whatever you have available, and of course a good dressing of bone meal. And then, once the tree is in, water, water, water. You must never, ever let it dry out. Well, I'm no good at growing things, but flower arranging I really enjoy. And the stark simplicity of these classical Japanese designs are stunning. They're from the Enshu school of classical Ikebana that gives every flower, every twig, a meaning of its own. Modern Ikebana is far freer in expression, more reminiscent of modern Western floristry. But whether you prefer ancient or modern, Eastern or Western, there's something here to inspire every flower arranger. The Horticultural Society sounds like an august and exclusive body. I asked its Director General, Chris Brickell, what were its aims? Well, basically, it is to spread knowledge of horticulture, encourage people to get involved in horticulture, um, whatever uh, their, their profession, whatever they uh, like, like to do in other ways. The Chelsea Flower Show is the pinnacle of the RHS year. What do you think of it this year? Well, I'm biased, as you will know, but I think it really is uh, absolutely outstanding this year. Tremendous quality and tremendous effort by the, all the growers that have been involved. Do you think it really is the greatest flower show in the world? 
Well, I'm pretty certain of that. Uh, if you get comments from overseas, you certainly know it's better than anything uh, that is shown in the States or Japan or elsewhere. Now, over the past few years, you've had this hanging basket, window box and, and courtyard garden displays here that amateur groups, local garden societies and clubs have been able to participate in. Do you think this is important? Oh, I think it's vital because, uh, after all, we're really a society for amateurs. Uh, and it's very important that we, we associate with and have people involved with the society who are amateurs and the results after three years you can see here. You can find the champion window box here and I've also found a window box champion. Derek Nimmer, you're something of an authority on window boxes. You've even written a book on them. What's the fascination? Well, the fascination was originally, of course, was that I didn't have a garden. So the only way I could have plants was to have a a lot of boxes on my window ledger. Uh, I love window boxes. I think that it's a great pity that people only think of them as a, a summer occupation. I mean, these days you can have flowers in abundance all the year round in your window boxes. Not just the, the spring flowers, but all that um, cyclamen that lasts so well through the winter and pansies and so on. So I think that uh, people ought to be compelled to have window boxes. And I did win a prize for having the best window boxes in Kensington a few years ago, would you believe? Now, there are one or two novelty boxes, I suppose, here. What do you think of them? Well, I mean, it's something quite extraordinary. You see, I love all these sort of... Uh, these are very simple here, in Partians, Busy Lizzie, which, which are always a traditional English window box, but down the other end, there are some carnivorous plants. A who window box? You never see anything quite so hideous. It's like a, a window box full of theatrical agents all sitting up and grabbing. It's um, most macabre, really. I don't think I should like to wake up every morning and see that, but it's, it's certainly different. And a lot of use of black-eyed Susie, which I like. There's a nice, lovely splash of yellow and some wonderful window boxes, just white daisies and so on. And I like all those little pale colours. The only thing I would quarrel with on this one, really, probably, is um, the Lobelia, which is an Oxford blue, because Jimmy Cooper once said that Oxford blue is very common and you can only have Cambridge blue. So being terribly socially insecure, I always plant plant Cambridge blue Lobelia now. I bet you've never seen a plant pot as big as this before, have you? Well, it's actually a lovely 17th century lead system. But you know, up until a few years ago, garden artifacts like this could well have been thrown away. Now, thank goodness, the tide of conservation has swept into gardening just as it has into everything else. And so garden, ornaments, statuary, and indeed plants and gardens themselves are now being conserved and saved. And as far as the plants are concerned, we have an organisation to help us. It's the National Council for the Conservation of Plants and Gardens. A bit of a mouthful, but it's the NCCPG for short. They tell us that there may be as many as 20,000 different plant varieties now under threat of extinction. This Daphne Hutiana, for instance, I'm told the world population of this plant was down to one individual only a few years ago. And now, through careful propagation and conservation, it's on the way back again. Now, you may be sitting there wondering why bother with all these old plant varieties? Surely we have enough new ones coming along every year. Well, that is not entirely true, because once a plant variety has gone, it's gone forever, and its characteristics have gone with it. And who knows what value plant breeders may need for those future characteristics in years to come. So the National Council for the Conservation of Plants and Gardens has organised what are called national collections, and anyone who's competent enough, be it a college, a private individual, a nursery, can look after the national collection of plants in their own speciality. And among those represented here at Chelsea are osteospermums, water lilies, foxgloves, evening primroses and aces. Those are now available for plant breeders now and at any time in the future to use. They have been saved for all time. Another aspect of the new interest in garden history is the recreation of gardens representative of different period styles. And here, Jane Fernley Whittingstall has created for Crabtree and Evelyn a garden of the Tudor style. And actually, after the Chelsea Flower Show, this garden is going to be moved to London Lighthouse, which is an area in West London, a care and treatment centre for AIDS sufferers. Now, when you look at this garden, you'll see that it's very different from the gardens we know today. It's very angular. There are angular beds. And at the front of the garden here, in fact, is what we call a knot bed, where the small plants have been arranged in a pattern that is very reminiscent of the pattern of knotted ropes. And when you look at the plants, you'll see that ornamentals and indeed edible plants are jumbled up together, not separated as we do today. But actually, in a garden of this age, very few of the plants were there for purely ornamental purpose. They had some medicinal, herbal or other value. In historical times, it's very true to say that garden plants really did have to earn their keep. History is one thing. Nostalgia is quite another. For me, it's actually sometimes more fun. It's got that greater feeling of romance. 
such as you'd find in this garden here, put together by the Women's Institute and Bridgemere Nurseries. Now, the WI, what do you know about it? Jam and Jerusalem? Well, there's no jam here, but there is Jerusalem, because this is what they call their green and pleasant land garden. The WI is celebrating their 75th anniversary this year, and every plant you'll find in this garden is more than 75 years old. So is the setting. Victorian Gothic folly behind me in pink stone. A moat edged and lined inside with wattle hurdles, as they would have been in the old days. And this garden is one that's been let go over the years, so the cultivated plants have been invaded by natives. Things like sweet woodruff and the wild native daffodil or lent lily. You may not find in here those big, fat, modern hybrids, but you will find a spirit of contentment that's not easy to locate in many other gardens. It's the kind of feeling you get on a soft summer's day in the Cotswolds, a sensation that's reflected in Stuart Gibbs' Cotswold Country Garden. Fruit and vegetables nestle together in the lee of a honey-brown wall. And if you think that the skills of the dry stone wall are dead, think again. They're alive and well and residing this week in SW3. Even city folk can have a taste of country living, like this tiny courtyard garden. Chris Hampton is a member of the award-winning Cottage Garden Society that's showing here for the very first time. We're an amateur society and the people that built this garden were all volunteers. And we are trying to encourage people to grow old-fashioned plants in a traditional manner. In this garden we have some very old plants. This aquilegia in the corner, which is a, a very dark blue one, would have been found in gardens in medieval times. Uh, it grows in dry situations, in hedgerows or at the edge of woodland. And there's a rose here? Yes, this rose is a very old rose. It's called Rosamundi, and it's a sport of the apothecary's rose, which is the oldest cultivated rose um, that is known. Sounds as if it might be difficult to get hold of them. No, it's not too difficult. They are obtainable from cottage garden nurseries throughout the country. But if people like to contact us, um, they can join us and have our seed list and they'll find many of these plants on our seed list and we can also put them in touch with nursery. Now you may be wondering where these traditional old garden plants can be obtained. Well the joy of Chelsea is that you can actually see exhibits staged by the nurseries that have maintained them or who've raised similar varieties more appropriate to modern garden conditions. There is, for instance, this superb display of violas staged by the nursery that maintains the national collection of these plants. Delphiniums have been transformed by breeding into the stately and disease-free plants that we see today. Double primroses largely disappeared in the last century, but now some exciting new varieties have been raised. And, of course, the lupin has been transformed in recent years with the new generation hybrids here, so we now have exciting new varieties to stand alongside the older forms. You might think that the nurserymen who grow these traditional plants have been doing the job since they left school, but that's not true in the case of the owner of Four Seasons Nursery, John Metcalf. John, how does a man who used to design scenery for the Muppets come to be running a hardy plant nursery? Well, I've always been interested in plants and I gradually seem to acquire a reputation when I worked at, in Central Television for having a knowledge of plants. Now, you've also been responsible for planting up the borders in the Daily Telegraph garden outside that was designed by Arabella and X Boyd. How does that differ from planting up a stand in the marquee? Well, within the marquee, one's trying to show a very wide range of plants. It's very difficult to put them together to make them look a whole unit. Now, in a garden, you're trying to make all the colours meld together. They're almost one continuous statement, either a contrast of form, of texture, or of colour. Now, in the Telegraph Garden, we've tried to make it a theme in a colour range, with little accents of highlights of occasional yellow within the purple, blue, white range. So that's what we've gone for, and try to make all the contrast of foliage work one within the other. In the world of formal gardening, the name of one man stands out as an authority, former director of the Victoria Albert Museum, Sir Roy Strong. Sir Roy, I thought this was just your cup of tea, this garden. Well, it is. I think it's absolutely beautiful. It's got good architecture. I mean, notice those beautiful dark green yew hedges and the and that marvellous gate at the back, leading on, I am told by the designer, Arabella Lentz Boy, to a yellow garden, which I think would be sensational. It's very interesting, and notice the beautiful soft planting around here, the, the patterning on the, on the brick, the four box domes that hold it together, and then that clipped feature in the centre, because in a way you look at a garden like that and think, that ought to have some sculpture in it. But I think she's been frightfully clever, because 
that would have made it a cliche. Instead, she sculpted the box. What is it about formal gardening that, that rouses your passion? We do seem to be going down that road now, don't we, in garden fashion? Well, Alan, I think the word formal is a killer. It's really geometric or architectural. Um, and I think we're going in that direction because they are more easy to maintain than what you think. If you have very good structure, like beautifully clipped hedges, trees which provide vertical accents placed in order, a bit of statuary, pattern on your paving, a sheet of water which reflects the sky, those sort of ingredients are permanent. And you may forget to prune your shrubs, you may let the border go to blazes, but the main structural elements will always be there and they'll give you tremendous satisfaction right through the year. When we come to Chelsea, we look at the state of the gardens and we see trends reflected. What do you think of them this year? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's year two of the waterfall. Everything's got a waterfall and everything's got fountains all over the place. It's, um, it's the cottage feel. Lots of soft, lovely colours, drifts of flowers to swoon over. I mean, almost as though you're looking at it in soft focus. Um, I think, and again, as I say, even the uh, nursery displays in the big tent are laid out in symmetrical patterns with box hedging around the edge. It is that trend to formality. Um, but it's a dream. You travel all over the world looking at gardens. Do you think the British are the best gardeners? Yes, I do, but I think I'm prejudiced. I think um, the British gave gardening to the rest of the world, not only in the form of the English landscape garden, but in the tradition that we see at Hidcote and at Sissinghurst, that beautiful combination of architecture with wonderful and sensitive planting. But in addition to that, I think we owe our dominance to a great school of garden writers, not only an older generation, but a new, younger generation coming up. Whenever I go into a bookshop all over Europe and the United States and elsewhere, I am always struck that most of the books are by British writers, either in the English language or in translation, and that ensures our triumph, might I say. Well, lots of gardeners have triumphed here this week, but perhaps none more so than David Stevens, who, for the second year running, has won the Wilkinson Sword Trophy for the best garden in the show with his B&Q Garden for Roses. Everybody, though, has their own preference when it comes to picking their favourite garden. Me? I think I side with Sir Roy Strong in choosing that Daily Telegraph formal garden, which also won a gold medal. What was your most exciting moment then, Stefan? I think, Alan, it had to be the excitement that I saw in Jane Cordingley's face. Do you remember she was the lady with the Daily Express garden, the one with the fallen trees? It had been a thrill for her. She'd seen her design realised here at Chelsea. She didn't win gold, she won silver gilt, but that didn't matter. The expression on her face exemplified the real essence of this show. How about you, Maura? Well, best for me was to actually meet some of the growers who've made these gorgeous displays. They're a lot of fun. I just hope maybe I've caught a little of their expertise. We could all do with a bit of that, if you could do with a bit of it. Tune in again to Chelsea Flower Show on Friday, BBC Two, 8.30, when Gardener's World will be coming to you from here. Better still, do as we've done, come yourselves. Tomorrow the show is open between 8 and 8. Admission fee for the whole day, £15. Come after 4 o'clock and you can get in for just £7. On Friday, the show's open between 8 and 5. Admission, £12. Come along and you'll agree with us that Chelsea is undoubtedly the best flower show in the world. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.